In this video, we'll have a look at A3.1 diversity of organisms, specifically genetic diversity, and it's part of the standard level and core content. So unity and diversity. Living things are going to organize their DNA into chromosomes, right? That's something that we all have in common, but we're all going to have different chromosome numbers, or at least in each species. So chromosome number is a characteristic, um, a defining characteristic of each species. So for example, in humans, we have 46 chromosomes. In something like a watermelon, there are 22 chromosomes, and then and I think goats have like 60 chromosomes, okay? So all of these goats should have 60, all humans should have 46, so on and so forth. So there's a really large range in chromosome number. It doesn't necessarily mean more complex, more evolved. It just means that something's genome is packaged into more pieces or less pieces. When thinking about common ancestors, how is it that we could have all come from a common ancestor yet have different numbers of chromosomes? Well, imagine that something only has two chromosomes to begin with. If something happens and one of these chromosomes gets separated, okay, then eventually it'll end up with chromosomes um, or a higher number of chromosomes. And so that's kind of one of the prevailing thoughts um, regarding how such uh, diverse uh, life forms could have still evolved from a common ancestor yet have different chromosome numbers. Now we can visually see chromosomes by looking at a type of picture called a karyogram. Okay, so this picture here, this is a karyogram and it is a human karyogram, or at least I think it might be. And the good indication here is that there are 46 chromosomes and we know that's a defining number for humans. It's not the only, humans aren't the only organism that have 46, but it's a pretty good guess for now. How do we get these pictures? Well, I'll tell you, your cells aren't this neatly organized. So first we have to find a cell who is undergoing mitosis. And the reason for that is because when cells are just an interphase or just their normal phase, if you haven't studied mitosis before, their DNA is not condensed or organized into chromosomes. That only happens when cells are undergoing mitosis. So step one, I find a cell that's undergoing mitosis. Then I'm going to stain the cell. Most things in our cells, including DNA, we can't really see them. So certain stains are going to attach to DNA. Okay, so I wanna do that. And then I'm going to burst the cell. And I'll tell you what, cells don't arrange their chromosomes in such nice, neat little pictures. They're kind of a mess, okay? Um, we need to put the chromosomes in order according to the position of the centromere. That's this little thing if these were replicated, that would hold them together. And basically this ends up organizing them in order from length, okay? Once I have this karyogram, I can then do a karyotype. So characteristic types of chromosomes in species, I can make certain assumptions about species um, from their karyogram, and that is called a karyotype. So for example, I'm assuming that this is a human because it has 46 chromosomes. I'm also going to assume that it's a male because it has an X and Y chromosome. If I saw different numbers of chromosomes, I could make other assumptions that would all be karyotypes. Before we get into how this plays into unity and diversity, let's go ahead and just define a couple of terms. So when we say genome, we mean all of the base sequences, the A's, T's, G's, and C's from DNA, all of that genetic information of an organism. Now a gene is just a segment of DNA that codes for a particular protein. So on one chromosome, you might have a gene for blood type and on another chromosome, you might have a gene for skin color. Okay, that's the difference between genes, one segment of DNA and the genome. Okay, so how are species showing unity? Well, species are going to have the same genes in the same positions on their chromosome. So you and I, we're the same species, and even though we are different and unique individuals, you and I will both have the same gene right here, okay? Both of us, same gene. 
The way that we demonstrate diversity is that the genes themselves might have different base sequences. So it, for example, your gene might have a slightly different base sequence than my gene, even though it codes for the same trait and it's located on the same chromosome. If you've studied genetics previous to this, we call those alleles, but just if you haven't, that is one possible difference that we could find, even if they're same gene, same species, located on the same chromosome. Now within a species, you're going to find that most of the DNA is the same. The vast majority, like well over 99% of your DNA and my DNA is identical. Well, why is it that we look different? Why do we have different traits? And where are those bits of different DNA found? Well, they're found in positions called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. All right, now these SNPs, or you can pronounce them SNPs, <laughs> are exactly what they sound like. Single nucleotide, so just one base sequence, polymorphism, which means I might have many different versions, okay? Those are gonna be spots in our DNA where people might have different nucleotides. In humans, out of about the three billion base sequences that we have, we only have about 5,000 locations that show any variation. So this means for the vast majority of our DNA, it's identical, and there's about 5,000 locations where there might be some differences. Let's talk about two very different things, a goat and an apple. Both of these are going to use DNA as their genetic information. Okay, but they may have some differences in terms of their genome size. So what that means is how many genes they have. And then also the base sequences, those letters, those A's, T's, G's, and C's, those patterns, those might also be different, okay? And so how might that work? Well, they may have a different number of genes, okay? Different organisms have different requirements, so they may need different numbers of genes. They may have different types of genes. I'm going to guess because a goat has legs, it's going to have different genes than an apple, okay? And then even if they share the same gene, it might have a different base sequence. So for example, I know that a goat and an apple both have a gene that helps them to synthesize RNA. I know that every organism is going to have that, but that gene may have a slightly different base sequence, you know, those letters, those patterns of A's, T's, G's, and C's, even if they have the same gene, it might be a slightly different sequence. So there's a lot of ways in which our genomes can vary. So how do I quantify genome size? Well, there's two ways I can do it. I can either quantify it by mass, but some problems with that are is DNA is very small. It has a very small mass. In fact, for humans, about six picograms. Oh, that's not very much um, of DNA. Or you can quantify it in terms of number of base pairs. So you can see for humans, um, we have quite a few base pairs. What is this, 3.2 trillion base pairs? And that's what we're seeing here in this diagram. So different organisms are going to have different numbers of base pairs. So you can see the range for different organisms. And some organisms have a very small range. Some organisms have a large range. Some organisms have a lot of base pairs. Some organisms have relatively few base pairs. <laughs> this is biology. There's a lot of diversity here. These can all be found in genomic databases, and that's something that you should familiarize yourself with. Genome sequencing is now a lot faster and a lot cheaper than it was when that technology um, first came out. And so this means we can sequence the genomes of many more different organisms than we could before. And there are some really cool applications here. So I've showed you these kind of like cladograms or evolutionary trees um, a few times, and we put those together based on evolutionary relationships. And sometimes if we can't sequence something DNA, we're making guesses about that relationship. 
And once we do that, sometimes it causes us to change our mind, right? So instead of thinking that something evolves this way, maybe it evolves this way. So we're rethinking some of our knowledge of how things are classified and how they evolved. We can also use this to fight certain diseases, so understanding which genes are present in which people, um, and creating personalized medicine. Some genes can even control how effective pain medication is. So I would say in the next few years, there's going to be some really exciting stuff here um, and some great potential applications for genomic sequencing.